talking about it should public transportation be viewed as a business or as a social service and I'm going to give you a little bit of history because we walk through this and show you how the needles moved and then kind of show you we're going to talk about what's going on now and see what it's going to rest so I hope you'll find you'll learn a little something today and uh, hopefully find a little bit interesting so the first thing is that you know how, you know, when you took a public transportation, and Steve and I talked about that, a lot of people just focus on northeastern Illinois, um, but there's also rural areas. So the chance, the, here's your challenge. The challenge is you got over 11, in the Chicago area, for example, population density over 11 million, 11,000 people per square mile. Now, then you go downstate, or even other areas like the Shawnee National Forest. Does anybody have any idea where Shawnee National Forest is? Scarily good. It is where? Uh, down south? Southern Illinois. <laughs> so if this is rural Southern Illinois, and if you haven't been down there, Scarf of the Gods is gorgeous. Um, it's in the Ohio River Valley, but a lot of people don't realize from here what Southern Illinois is like. And as you can see, you know, Polk County's got a population density of 12 per square mile, Johnson County 36 per square mile. So the point here is in, in, in Southern Illinois, we have one of our transit systems rides that covers 16 counties. They've got 160 vehicles, $11 million annual budget, and they're the major employer in Southern Illinois. So it's it really it's it's important and in it, in terms of not only urban transportation but rural transportation. And I won't dwell on those issues, but they're I've been involved in both, but they each have their own challenges and needs. Um, so this is just kind of a couple of fun slides for you. Public perception of urban transportation usually is like just a bunch of buses crowded around, you can't get anywhere, jam, etc. You know, yeah, been. So this is some people's fear of riding the subway. You know, uh, in Chicago, that's getting better. Uh, you know, kind of buses breaking down all the time. Uh, it's kind of been the stereotype perception, stereotype perception for rural. You know, that, you know, kind of freelance people just all jumping on the bus. You know, a ancient vehicles where they, you know, kind of wild west. Uh, you know, there's a horse on a train. So, uh, that, uh, you know, this is always kind of funny. Driver under instruction. So that was that's kind of, you know, it'd be right. and you know, kind of your peace and love bus. So that's kind of sometimes the perception of, of rural public transportation, which isn't the case. So. I'm going to talk about briefly what are some of the major events that these, you know, there's a lot of events, and Steve could, is, is as much about this as I do. There's a number of events that have, have caused changes in, in the way public innovation is funded and viewed. I'm going to cover some of those, so we have all of those. Um, what's the current event that's going on now that you guys are all involved with that's really making a dramatic and dramatic change? Where is public transportation headed as a result of this change? And then an open discussion that you have. You can talk about any of that. And bears and cubs, I don't know much about it except they're, you know, cubs won. But, you know, any other transportation issues you might have uh, been around for a long time, uh, be happy to discuss and we're involved at the federal level as well. So, that one, migration from urban to rural. Okay, so if you look back, Chicago, 1870, current population, huge, huge growth in Chicago, land metropolitan area. Polk County, Southern Illinois, actually has lost population almost in half in that time period. Johnson County has kind of stayed the same. Uh, so you just say not much is happening in rural Illinois. It's all the big urbanized areas, big mobile shift. So this also kind of shows you over time growth in a metropolitan area and the growth in the non-metropolitan area. So why is that important? Well, what happened is around the 1900s, all these people going to large urbanized areas, all of a sudden, how are we going to get people to work and to their jobs? And you may not know this, you may or may not know this. You know, 1903, Chicago was the largest trolley car city in America. And uh, far surpassed San Francisco. And so this cable car system. So back then, I, the needle points to public transportation was a business. All right. In fact, it was a very competitive business. In fact, they used to run separate lines down different streets. Different companies had different lines. And what they would do is they'd change the width of the wheelbase of the trolley cars so they couldn't, another company couldn't run on another company's tracks. So that's how they would segregate their own 
business model. But again, you know, you people didn't have access to any other, you know, this was their mobility, this is how they got around. So that was kind of one of the first events. And then, again, the same migration after we had trolley cars, 1935 to 58, the Chicago surface lines operate trolley cars. Trolley buses, you know, you had 3,700 trolley buses around the city. Okay, again, these are all fixed route services, okay, and that really kind of happened over 500 service miles, you had 100 routes. So again, to deal with, again, this is a business. This was getting people, okay, from two jobs to medical, uh, you know, employment, you know, employment, education, etc. So, um, then what you saw near more in the 1950s was people started. You know, we'll talk about you know a little bit. Is, is people started spreading out, and all of a sudden, you know, your fixed routes didn't work. They weren't able to adapt to changes in the urban environment. You had people relocating to work in different places, living different places, and that's all of a sudden when buses started coming in the thing, that was the new modern thing. Buses, buses had flexibility. Trolley cars had to go on the trolley tracks. And it's so funny, as we go full circle, the big thing now is everybody wants BRTs and everybody wants railroad on a fixed track. So uh, I think there's a stabilization issue. People, if they see something on a railroad track, they think it's going to stay as opposed to a bus that might leave. So that was certainly... <laughs> created that. To me, it meant, too, growth of automobile ownership, as well as housing. So early on, you didn't have mobility options. To me, it's all about customer mobility. That's what this is all about. We'll see it as we go through the whole slide presentation. So with the advent of people buying and affording automobiles, all of a sudden, they now didn't have to rely on public transportation as their mode of choice for mobility. They had other modes that they could use. So now we start seeing people less and less patronage on, on the, the public transportation system, especially in the urbanized areas. Okay, still kind of on the, you're still on the, on the business model at this point, at least through the 1950s. You're still on the business model. Um, but then you had migration, to me, event three is the migration, okay, from urban to suburban for both housing and jobs. And you can see the real growth over time, how this shifted. And yet all this urban sprawl, um, I was victim of that. My mom and dad moved from the inner city out to Glenview at the time, and there was nothing out there. Um, and because housing was affordable, you could get a bungalow house they bought for $21,000, <coughs> okay, back then. Um, but at the same time, my mom didn't drive. And my mom was a city girl, and a lot of friction. I was only going to that side of it, but but it was it was tough because she couldn't, she didn't have the mobility she had in the urban environment. So the plus was you could go out there. Yes, there was rural services. I used to take the night motor coach down to meet my grandmother downtown here every once in a while, and that was an unbelievable ride for a young kid. It would, I don't know, it took me an hour and a half, two hours, whatever it took to get downtown. But it was very sparse, so you, you know, service was maybe a couple times a day uh, at best. So you really started seeing where now there's starting to be some strain on the public transportation systems in terms of being a business in order in order to attract enough people to pay the fares to make it profitable and along those lines. <clears throat> Event four: federal funding, ADA Title VI. So. This is all coming in the late 50s, early 60s. All right, Johnson in 64 passed the urban mass transit legislation. <coughs> private bus companies are having a hard time making ends meet. Private railroads are having a hard time making ends meet. This is all part of the civil rights program initiative, saying, hey, people still living in the poor, and other people still need transportation options. We can't let transportation just disappear. Now you start seeing the needle starting to move to the social service side. All right. And the reason I say that is, is, and you'll see, I tell the same story when I go out to my rural providers and we give money to a lot of, the, I've got rural systems in just about every county in Illinois. But a lot of them, when I go in, I say, you know what, I'm like the Trojan horse. I got money, you open the gate, let me in with my money, the side door is open, you have all these compliance requirements. You've got Title VI, you got American with Disabilities Act, <coughs> all right, and you've got uh, drug and alcohol testing, uh, you have all these you know, compliance requirements, understand what you're getting into before you let me in the door. Well, so what happened is now you start to get federal money coming in to help fund public transportation. 
started out as US DOT, and it became your Mass Transportation Associate, uh, Administration, and now it's the Federal Transit Administration. So it's kind of, the names have kind of changed over time and a little more focused uh, in terms of its, it, what its focus is. So one of these, these are what I would call is unfunded mandates. So the federal government says you want our money, now you're going to have to institute as a, as a public system our laws and regulations. So one of them, this is, we talked about an unfunded mandate, the American with Disabilities Act. And I think what it's done has been wonderful for people with disabilities. That's not, not the issue. But we signed the law in 1990, but okay, now you had to have lifts on your fixed route, fixed route buses. You had to provide accessibility to everybody. You had to have complimentary paratransit service, means that you, if they can't get to a fixed route bus, you have to provide paratransit service, same days, same hours of the day, same days of the week that you're on fixed route service. All right, so now this has to be complimentary to that. Rural paratransit service, it says, okay, you can't deny a trip for somebody that can't necessarily use your bus unless you can't physically handle them, and then you had to change that over time. So all my rural providers, all of lift equipped buses um, as well. Mm -hmm. Facility accessibility, you find, okay, all the facilities have become accessible. And this was a real challenge for places like Chicago and CTA. You've got infrastructure that's hundreds of years old, that now, how do you now start putting in elevators? How do you start putting in accessibility uh, uh, facilities to help these people get onto a train, off a train, et cetera? And CTA still is not fully, every station is not fully accessible yet. And this was put in the law in 1990. Um, just because of the enormous cost to do that. Uh, now, the plus side of all, all of this, if you ever ride, ride a bicycle down the street and you're on the sidewalk and you get to the corner and they're all curb cuts, well, those were done for people with disabilities. The common output is if you ride a bicycle, if you push a stroller, anything like that, or if you break your foot and you got to be in one of those little carts my buddy had that push for a while, all of a sudden these things, you know, all of a sudden they're, they're really a benefit to you and you understand what the barriers were these people with disabilities to be able to use public transportation. Okay? We just moved the needle a little more to the social services. Title VI, passed in 1964. Non discrimination. Okay? You can't discriminate against who's going to use your bus. So there's a couple things here. I got a PACE example. This is just recently. A lady called up, wanted to use the paratransit service. Paratransit says you have to call me 24 hours in advance, okay? She wanted to take the trip on Monday to the doctor. She's Orthodox Jewish. She can't make the call on Saturday because they're not open on Sunday, so you have to call on Saturday, all right? They denied her the service, okay? She wanted to call on Friday to make the reservation for Monday, all right? That could just, it'll get, but that's just, they're saying, well, this is discrimination. You, you know, you have to make reasonable accommodations to handle this person's request. Yeah, there's always this reasonable accommodation. But they, somebody would say that's not really an unreasonable request. That, uh, so you can't deny people on age and religion and, and race, etc. The other thing is multi-language. <coughs> what you don't realize, in a lot of, especially in my rural systems, you now, if somebody comes in the door and they speak Taiwanese, they speak Mandarin, Whatever they speak, you have to have a way that they can get your information on your system. And so, and for the, a lot of these rural systems, you may, you may have nobody in your community, you may have, and you also have to have Braille, as well as large print. So, it's very interesting how AT&T has a 1-800 number. It's so interesting that they all subscribe to, so if somebody comes in and speaks a certain language, you can call up AT&T and they have an interpreter that you pay for to do that. So it's kind of neat, but it's again, this is one of these, again, <clears throat> things that have come up in terms of non-discrimination that was really an unfunded mandate that all of a sudden public transportation has to respond to, the needle moves a little bit more to the social service center. Is that AT&T number available to private businesses or just to private I think businesses? It, I think it is. No, it's... Private businesses, you just subscribe. It costs you X amount of money, I think, to join, and I'm not an expert on that, but so much if you, whatever call you make. But it's okay. it's an interesting service, and it really provided a lot of you know accessibility. Okay. Environmental justice. So this says, okay, if I want to build a nice station on the north side of Chicago, I can't build a dumpy one in a poor neighborhood. 
okay, or if I want to have some amenity on this part of the city, I need to make sure that I have equal amenities on the other part. An example would be even in St. Louis, we were doing a light rail extension in St. Louis on the Illinois side, and the first designs came back for some of the bridges that the, the trains are going to come over, and some of the cantonair, some of the, the structures going to then hold up the tracks. Well, the design was a little less fancy than what they have on the St. Louis side. F F FTA said... You should explain the difference between East St. Louis and St. Louis. Oh, okay, so what you have down in St. Louis, you're right. Down in St. Louis, you got this thing called the Mississippi River, <laughs> okay? And, and so, obviously, St. Louis is on... The, the bulk of St. Louis is on the west side of Mississippi. East St. Louis, which is very poor. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like Appalachia at times. Very poor area um, on the west side, now on the east side. And then what we did years ago was, this is very interesting from a public transportation perspective, this is always which comes first, chicken or the egg, because from FTA they say we wanted to extend the light rail out to Scott Air Force Base. And the premise was if we built the light rail, development will occur around that light rail corridor. And, but the feds at the time says, yeah, that's nice for a full funding agreement. Show me your ridership. Show me you've got the ridership to sustain this investment. Well, the whole thing was, well, wait a second. No, we feel if we put this investment in, that's going to spur growth and economic growth on the Illinois side. So it's one of those that, you know, which, which way do you go, which is the chicken and the egg. You need to have to, you have to be able to project ridership and existing demand to justify it or will putting this infrastructure in help you. It turns out that they went ahead and put the infrastructure in and it has is really spring growth around the whole corridor. So it's been very much a success. But to go back for station design and support of the system itself, on the East St. Louis side, poor neighborhood, it wasn't as nice as what they had on, on, the, on the Missouri side in St. Louis. FTA said, no way, it's got to look the same. So again, environmental justice issue, pushes the needle to, okay, more towards the social service. As a business, you say, what do I care? It holds, it holds up the track. That's all I really care about. Event 5, FTA's privatization initiative. And Steve can probably talk more about this than I can, but I'm not going to talk about this very much, except in the early 1990s, there was a lot of discussion about privatizing certain aspects of federally funded projects and assets and public transportation was one of them. And there was a real push from FTA to get, especially your big urbanized systems, to privatize some of their public transportation service. Well, it's interesting, the private guys only wanted to take over the routes that were profitable. Okay, so what did that leave CTA if they would have done that? You got the garbage, okay? I mean, you know, so luckily it never really went anywhere, okay? They, you know, they weren't, so this is one of those where FDA said the needle's got to point both ways, okay? It's got to be as a business and social service, and that really didn't work out uh, very well uh, for all those reasons. Um, final event, which you guys are all involved in, is technology. And this is going to, I don't even know where this is going to change things. You know, this is something that you guys are going to be dealing with from a policy perspective. Um, and... It's interesting because a lot of this is from presentation I heard out in Washington, and it's this mobility on demand. It used to be that we wanted things on, you know, just get things on time. Then it became, you know, real time, and now everything is on time, and now it's we want it now. It's now time. So when well, you guys want stuff, you want it now. So in public transportation, in, you know, this whole demand modeling is changing. And so what you really see is obviously how is this mobility on demand? Well, how's public, we talked about how's public transportation going to play into that? All right. So this is this is really the, the, you know to me the challenge. So public transportation, the big P versus little P. So public transportation in the back used to be buses, maybe rail. You know, mobility we're talking about. Men have taxi cabs. Then you start having some van pooling, ride sharing. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got bicycle sharing. You've got Airbnb, you know, you got that sharing, you've got car sharing, you've got Uber, you got Lyft, you have all these different entities now coming in to the marketplace. 
Uh, and what is, is, do, we, do we change the definition of public transportation? That's A, or how is that going to impact public transportation in the future? So, this, so a little food for thought, you know, this is kind of looking at, okay, how does technology can integrate all these various aspects? So, who do you think put this shirt together? Anybody want to take a guess? Uber? Got Uber? Anybody else? Google? Google? Another chip, okay. Anybody else? Ford Motor Company. Put this together. They understand where's the future going. Okay? It's going to be driverless. You know, they, they're already buying into driverless cars. Okay? So, to me, what is that going to do? Like for my mom, who couldn't drive because of her sight, a driverless car would have been a godsend for mobility for her. And it wouldn't be, it's not just mobility, but we get back to this mobility on demand, where she could, in fact, not too far down the road, you know, use her phone or have somebody call up to be able to get a vehicle, part of this vehicle, take her from point A to point B. And, you know, she used to trudge with the bus, she used to ride the L all the time. You know, in the wintertime, that became very difficult. So, this is really starting to transform where we're going. So, where are we headed? You know, a changing transportation system, as I mentioned. How are all these different aspects going to come into play for mobility? For people. New mobility demands and solutions. The reason I it, it, are kind of talking about the wild, wild west is you used to have public transportation, you had private transportation. They used to intersect a little bit. Now they're starting to intersect more and more. And how do we deal with that intersection? Okay, and again, this is interesting because Uber is being sued because they're now big enough that they're looked as a as a public civil entity and they don't have lift to quick cars. All right. Okay, so they're not they're not meeting ADA. All right. Well, they'll, they, they, again, these are the things that are just starting to you know start happening in this whole marketplace changes. Um, other interesting things: um, first mile, last mile. That's if you're, transportation. It's always the buzzword you're going to hear. How do we get to the public transportation system? How do we get to it? How do we get from our endpoint home or the business, whatever? Well, when you start looking first mile, last mile, where does Uber come in? Where does Lyft come into play? Where does driverless cars start to come into play? Um, they're starting to look at in Miami is the public transportation system is starting to look to partner with Uber for this last mile, all right, transportation. And where it's really kind of interesting, they're looking at in low-income areas, which has always been very difficult to serve with taxi cabs. They don't want to go there um, for a whole host of reasons. But they're looking at like an Uber example where they can find drivers who live in that community, so they're providing jobs for those people in the community, and maybe offer them a base amount, let them just cruise that particular zone, and say, okay, we know we may not get enough demand on your own, but should the transit system maybe support a certain level per hour for that driver? And then they can make up the rest on, in terms of rides they carry. So again, just something to start to look at, is this an option? Okay, to have the private end start working with the public end to work on this first mile, last mile. Out in California, there was a gentleman that just started a, a service where he, was, he lived on a bus route, and in the morning it was very congested, and he, people would, buses would go by, people were left standing, okay, on the corner, uh, until the next bus came, and he said, hmm, hmm, what, what if I uh, run a bus on reserve seating for people? Guess what? So we started doing. You call up, you reserve a seat on the bus. You know when that bus is going to come, you've got a seat on that bus. So he's now picking up that particular excess demand on that corridor. Now, again, the same in, 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 so that's the issue it starts talking about now is again it starts going into the social justice issue. Okay, those that can afford it can do it. Okay, so you got to be careful that you don't start decreasing public transportation to the point that the people that can't afford that don't have options. So that's going to be some of this intersection of private and public. And my daughter the other day came to town and she was going downtown to meet some folks and she had a choice, public transportation or Uber. And she decided that this was to take an hour and a half, this would have taken 40 minutes. The decrease in travel time was worth the additional cost. 
But again, she could afford to do that. But that, those are starting to see the mode choices that are going to start happening out there. So this is really kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, you know, so this is that shared use mobility relationship I'm talking about. And I don't know what the impact's going to be on public transportation. You know, these are, you know, you, you obviously, in a lot of systems, you know, like CTA, you've got fixed route rail. You have fixed rail. But on the bus side, is it will get to the point where you can dispatch buses on demand as opposed to a schedule, or can you vary the schedule? I'm not sure. Um, or, or start having relationships with these private companies. Another example of what's happening on the private side of public transportation, I was just talking to the RTA. If you go on Google, Google's got a trip planner. The RTA no longer needs a trip planner. Okay, it's costing over a million, million dollars a year to support a trip plan. They don't need that because private industry has already taken that. And you think some of this, this stuff that's happening in terms of where's your bus locator, train locators, that kind of stuff. Google, all these people, all these private industries are now creating the infrastructure that, to me, public transportation can take advantage of and not have to pay for. So it's how is this all going to work out um, as we go along? What's the government's role? in this as, we, as these two overlap more and you start using these smartphones and you know things like uh, drivers you know is there any kind of regulations on drivers any kind of regulations on vehicles um, you know as again with you know uber in terms of picking up people without you know this with people with disabilities are there going to be civil right issues you know what where does the government come into play there what is there well, i don't know the answer to that this is all changing very quickly um, from there and and again, as I said, what's the role of public transportation? So that's for you guys to <laughs> get to start figuring out how this is all going to play out. So as we move forward, you know, as public transportation, now again, again, we were, we, public transportation moved way over to the social service side, and all of a sudden, we all this competition for private industry, and now where is that needle going to end up? All right, so is, is it a business? Is it an amenity to help people get around easier and safer? More on the social service side. Okay, this is more of this social necessity, like heat, electricity, clean drinking water, good food. Should this be a civil right that people have a mobility option in terms of public transportation? Yeah. Or is it all the above? And it may very well be. So um, these are just, you know, so my advice is just ride the animals. <laughs> 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 That kind of ends my little formal presentation, but I'd be happy, along with Steve, to any, anything else that's on your mind you want to discuss. Yeah. I think that it, you know, I mean, for many, especially some people don't have driver's licenses, I mean, it, it, I think that it's more or less a social necessity. Um, you know, it could be, if, if persons have options more, then you could say that it's an, an amenity, but, you know, many, Definitely, if you rely on it, if it's your only transportation, you're looking at it as a necessity. Right. So that becomes. If you don't have it, and you, it's hard to walk to the place. Well, what are you going to do? Right. So that becomes. It goes more to the social service side. Okay. Anybody have an idea? Fair. You know what fare box recovery ratio is? How much money somebody drops in the fare box as opposed to your total cost? About fifty percent. Fifty-five. In Chicago, we'll start with Chicago. Okay. He says about fifty percent. 55. Okay, 55. 45. What's that? 70. 70? 45. 45. Okay, let's go to college. So, how much they take in on a fare when you get on the bus and you pay a fare, or you got your, that you've paid on your venture card, how much does that fare cover your total operating costs? Okay. How about rural? I mean, how about collar counts? What's that? Less. Forty. City of Chicago mandated fifty percent. Okay, but there's an asterisk because they get certain other money. They can't meet fifty percent. They get other certain money from the state that they can count towards their fare box revenue. So it's kind of a you know kind of a little bit of a fudge. Okay, but even for the CTA, they can't make fifty percent of costs. Okay, pace I think is twenty yeah. percent. Well, it depends on, so there's the NTD approach, which is the FTA. They, they require all systems to report the same data. So they cut out that state money that's you know, used for fare box. When you level the playing field, 
it is CTA more like in the in the 40s, high right. 40s, and that's <coughs> maybe about the same area. Uh, pace is probably around 30. Right, right around 30. Uh, rural systems. Zero. Anybody want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> I was reading about uh, pace ADA today. It's 10 uh, percent. Okay, not rural, but we'll talk about right. ADA complementary and how this. I think this is really noise and that's going to help that. Okay, my rural areas, five to 15 percent. Yeah. Oh, then there's some urban areas yeah. that get. Yeah, I got 20. some Decatur. I mean, I got Decatur is probably 10 percent. Okay, Springfield maybe, I don't think he'd make 20%. So, you know, it... Go ahead. I, I've been told, and maybe you can verify this, that the only transit system in the world that actually runs out of the box is Hong Kong. I don't know if you know, I know yeah, a lot of other countries. I, I don't know. Countries, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, so I was just in Munich and they claim 100%. Oh, really? But, okay. again, they're fudging because that count subsidies for discounted fares for the disabled and for students. So it, you got to look and try and level it, look at apples to apples comparison. But you're right, um, but the reason why Hong Kong is, it does so well, they're, they're also a real estate development company. And so that development money helps pay for the operation of the transit system. Okay. Just how they got started here. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wasn't that fudging the numbers that they used to stay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, just, but, so public accurate. transportation now is really on the social service side. It takes a tremendous amount of, of public dollars to get going. You mentioned complimentary paratransit. I think this is an area of mobility on demand, this private Uber. Right now, it costs about $25 a trip, $25 to $30 a trip for every complimentary paratransit trip provided by the CTA. I think I'm pretty close. Yes. Uh, downstate, St. Louis is about the same thing. It's right around that range. Extremely expensive service to provide. Well, if we start getting to the point of shared Uber rides, shared Lyft rides, driverless cars, you know, this kind of stuff, the on demand, because what they're saying is everybody's going to have a smartphone. So that's not a social justice issue. Everybody's going to have a smartphone and therefore be able to access. So um, the American Public Transportation Association has a program. It's called uh, Leadership Apta. And it, it trains people who are professionals moving up the ladder, but it, it exposes them to things they otherwise wouldn't learn about in their jobs so they can be broader perspective on their jobs and actually advance faster in the industry. <coughs> their project this year was, was um, <coughs> shared mobility and transit. And their conclusion after interviewing people around the country and someone around the world was transit better be the coordinator. Because in the long run, if they don't get in there and coordinate and become integrated, they're going to be the losers. Well, it's interesting because here's another concept that I thought, there's two other concepts that I thought about. One is, which plays off of this, anybody heard of the company called Coyote? Yeah. All right. What does Coyote do? If you're not familiar, Coyote is a brokerage for truck drivers. All right. So basically what they do, they go to a company and say, I'll guarantee you, you won't pay more than 500 bucks for me to haul that load of, of whatever out of your plant. I'll guarantee that. It's all you're going to pay. And then they go back, and then when the company calls up and says, okay, i got a load to go, they go out in the marketplace, all their truck drive, and they're negotiating prices with everybody. If they can find somebody to take it for 350 bucks, Coyote just made 150 bucks because they're getting 500 bucks from, the, from the, uh, the company they work with. If they can't find somebody, if they got to find somebody for 600 bucks because demand is high, Coyote lost 100 bucks because they're only getting 500 bucks. What I see is, could that happen in the mobility brokerage industry, where you could have a company like that, okay, that starts saying, hey, you call up, I need a ride, okay, I gotta go see the doctor. And they're gonna go out in the marketplace, and they're gonna see who's gonna give you the best price to provide that ride. To me, that's not that far off, okay, that that could happen. So whether the public transportation is the entity that's gonna be the broker, or somebody else is gonna be the broker, that's one possibility. I feel like it's already kind of <coughs> happening. I know there's some apps that show you, like Ride Scout, I think. It shows you how, like maybe five or six different ways that you can get to from point A to point B. It shows you the time that it's going to take, how to do it, and what it's going to cost. And usually Uber is at the top <laughs> because they probably pay for a sponsor right. or something like that. Right. But it's always the fastest, usually. It's always most expensive. But it, which is, so, so we're, we're heading that way. So it's more like a hospital, but a hospital says, hey, okay, i gotta get, I got to get some 
somebody here for a doctor's appointment. Yeah, they, yeah. they might want to go to a broker. I'm just saying it's a right, possibility. Right, right. The other concept that I've always been interested in is, is, we, is regional employment centers. You know, we always have this model that we got to take everybody, you know, from their home to where they work. And my concept <laughs> is if we could have more, because I don't believe that people long run like to work at home alone. That's my, that's my premise. I could be wrong. My premise is I don't like to work at home alone. If I'm working at home as an employer and a manager, how do I know that person is really doing their job all day long? I, I don't really know. And a lot of times when you're a professional in this industry, my productivity, I can't measure my productivity every day. I don't make it. Well, I don't make widgets. I don't have to produce. I, I get to do other things. So um, is, there, is there a chance to, to not be productive? Yes. But if you have mobility employment center, to me, then you could have one human resource person to share companies, one IT person to share companies. You could have situations where the uh, daycare is right next door. It's right part of it. We did this in Peoria. Yeah, the bus transfer center, the YMCA put in a, a daycare facility right there. Because we had a lot of people who had, were very, coming from poor sections, okay, the, the jobs, how did they get their kids? Well, here they could go right to the transfer center, drop the kid off on the way home, pick them up, okay? Well, you could have daycare, you could have cleaning, whatever. Um, because what's happened, in my own experience is, you don't, it's a long time ago, you don't go home to work, work to home. I used to go home, Drop off daycare, work, Sam's Club, Home Depot, pick up the kid, home. You know what I mean? So, it, you know, then that doesn't work well for public transportation. So, you know, anyway, that's just my little spiel. Anything else out there? Lisa? Um, I just was wondering how difficult do you think it would be to impose a requirement, an ADA requirement, on the players in this, especially? private businesses concerned and brokerages. So, you know, you, you say if you want to be in the brokerage, you must have X number of vehicles that are ADA equipped or something like that. Well, that's going to be interesting because that gets back what's the government's role. Okay, they could do it. They could mandate it because they're, well, first of all, ADA is civil law. So you have to do certain things by civil law. But if the FDA was funding it, I mentioned before, the Trojan horse comes in, compliance comes out the side. No longer funding with any federal dollars, what yeah, what, what what becomes the incentive or the mandate to do that? That's that's part of this wild west part that's still. But it, it seems almost impossible to get away from some kind of subsidy um, if you're actually going to coordinate uh, multi, across multiple services. But well, but if you're a brokerage, now you're going out and finding out who's got a lift equipped vehicle that's willing to take that trip for a certain amount of money. Okay. So that to be a specialization so that, can, for right. for somebody. Right. Well, there's also the flip it. There's the issue of Uber coming in and helping Pace be more uh, less costly and uh, applying their business model yep. to a public requirement. So it, it it can start working that way too, and then you start seeing the blending. Yep. Agree. Hundred percent. Yep. I was wondering how well you think our funding mechanisms match the goal of transit. So we do gas tax, here sales tax, and uh, fares, obviously. Um, and then we have this diversity of goals of equity and disability and you know getting people to work and economic development. Um, I think there's an excellent question. Where do you want to put the needle? All right. Before, you use gas tax because that was it. it's, it's, a, it's a use tax. That was the theory. You're running on the highways, you're running on the streets, you're, you're, because you're on them, you're, we have to build them, and we have to maintain them. So therefore, the gas tax was a use tax. All right, that's how it was always built. All right, you know, but now, um, you know, people are driving, you know, mm -hmm. gas, unless you want to raise taxes, nobody does, you know, you can still be viewed as a use tax. Uh, you just have to raise taxes, but then you start getting into, well, I won't digress too much, what do you do with electric cars? We have a public policy that says we want to increase cafe standards. All right, but if we increase cafe standards, then we should be promoting, all right, non fossil fuel vehicles. But if we do that, they're not paying the gas tax and support the road. So now this, this whole industry, the whole government's trying to figure out, well, do we do vehicle miles? And we start tracking vehicle miles. And do you pay by the Oregon's doing that? Well, with that big brother coming in and monitoring your whereabouts. You know, so 
I, you know, to me, if, if that's where the country's got to make this decision, where is it? And the social service, then to me, it should be funded as a social service. And, and if you have buses that aren't full, you know what? Yeah, you're going to have buses that aren't full. That's what you'll always hear. Oh, the bus goes on the street, nobody's on it. Well, you know what? Probably on that trip in, it was probably carrying a good number of people. And if I got to provide service to a low income neighborhood on Sunday nights, you know what? We're not going to carry a lot of people. Just, we just have to acknowledge that as a society. Yes? When you were talking about um, Miami as an example for using Uber as a partial that kind of funding or public funding um, just to go into low income areas or that extra mile, would that also then cut costs for those people? Would it be cheaper for them to use Uber versus other areas? Because um, it's Uber versus the bus. If it's in well, and obviously the transit system is trying to make this first mile, last mile connection. And that's, that's a very good point. That's a very expensive end for public transportation. <clears throat> so, if they can, not, so if they can work with a company like Uber, okay, where you, the, let's say by subsidizing that trip, all right, so the customer pays the same, okay, even transfers and pays the same fare for that, but the difference is being subsidized for the transit system, okay, is that something that makes sense? Okay. So the customer would pay the same as a bus fare? It could, for, yes. I mean, they, they, you could do whatever you wanted, okay, but it certainly it, in those situations you start getting the social justice issue of, you know, are, is that person, really, can that person pay more, can they afford more, is that different than somebody else? But on the last mile here in Chicago, in the summer, it's one of the best last mile arrangements we have. It's with the shuttle hub uh, in the Lake uh, Cook TMA, uh, Lake Cook um, Arterial Road. It's a corridor, uh, and they have a transportation management association. And the companies in that area help pay for the shuttle bug, but Pace also subsidizes that shuttle bug. So when you bring in something like Uber in that business model, how does that business model make that service less expensive and maybe more demand responsive? So that you're still, you're contracting with a private company, but you're, you're providing public subsidies that you're going to have to pay anyway, but you want to pay less of that, so find them the least expensive models by which to do that. Right. That's what we have to think about, right. be creative about. And the same thing where right, you know, job action is reverse commute. All right, so ride sharing to a job. The issue has been, if you're in a van pool, what if one member gets sick at work, or their kid gets sick? How do you get transportation home for that person? All right, okay. These other models maybe start coming into play to provide mm -hmm. that accessibility, okay, to augment that, that type service. So that's another area. So, I don't really understand paratransit in that I, it's like we've been talking about, it's really expensive and it seems like the way that Pace is approaching or thinking about working with Uber could be a, a no-brainer option for most of what paratransit does. I mean, paratransit, I guess, does, like, because I just, in the way that there are huge vehicles, right, there are big vehicles and they're only pulling maybe a few people at a time at the most, usually one person. So it just seems like paratransit would be done much more efficiently if it did really go more towards working and subsidizing Uber to, you know, like you were talking about. Except, I agree, but you got to let Uber be able, you're going to have to change the playing field a little bit. You know, can, can, they, can they pick up other people? Can they do other things along the way? Okay. Um, you well, know, they, they do that already in some cities, I think. And in like LA, they have like a group. Right. Share right, like exactly. a van pool yep. type thing. Yes. So I mean, I just don't understand. I because I, I haven't when I heard about it from Pace. You know, when they were they're only thinking about doing it in certain places, and it's kind of like a revolutionary idea for them at least. Um, and kudos to them. But I just don't understand why that idea isn't being pushed more. I haven't heard much about it otherwise. It's, it's all it, it's all changing because it, it, you're correct, and I, it, it's really going to go that way because it's like. Right now, Pace spends a tremendous amount of money on dispatching. Well, if you can go to Uber and you're, you need a ride and you're a disabled person, you got a phone and you've got to go when, and all of a sudden Uber's taking care of that, you don't need your all that infrastructure for dispatch. Okay? You may not but, have the 24-hour notes. You know, right. 
And, uh, but, you know, there's other, but again, you have to start saying, oh, but again, it should probably cost that user more. Someone's got to pay for that. It takes time. When you pick up somebody, they have, it takes time to get in, in, in the vehicle, all right? It takes time that they have to tie them down. There's a lot more time to low down of those vehicles. So the dwell time for that vehicle is much higher. And for an Uber driver, they want to be, you know, picking up people, dropping them. So you have to think about that, that as well. But absolutely, I think that's where they're going to have to start thinking creatively, like 100%. I want to ask, I don't know if you, uh, uh, it's a little specific, but um, what do you think about the cuts that the CT sometimes make? I mean, like, with, do you know the situation with the 11 Lincoln bus? Like, there are aldermen who are involved in that to try to bring it back? Yes, fully. Sure. What, what is your well? You it, 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 and Pace has the same thing again. It's it's they've got cost constraints. Okay, yes, the needle's pointing to the social service side. Okay, so what they look and, and do is 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 you know the city is always changing. Neighborhoods are changing. Neighborhoods are growing, and so they're always trying to react to you know the West Loop area 20 years ago was nothing. Okay, so they're trying to look at productivity. Okay, on their vehicles, and they evaluate that. And if the productivity, Pace does the same thing. The productivity gets below a certain level, they say, look at it. This is just not cost effective at all for us to be out there running a bus. So that's where they're kind of, you know, they don't have unlimited funds. So they got to say, okay, I got to do the best I can with the, with the money I have. You can't meet all the needs of all the people all the time. That's unfortunately, you can't do it. So that's, that's kind of what happens along those corridors. You know, and of course now CTA, I mean, it's, you know, BRT, they're, they're looking at, I think, Ashland Avenue. Maybe they'll do something for some reason. It's back, this, to, it's back to Express Bus. You that. know, I mean, yeah, but this region really hasn't embraced BRT. You know, I think BRT's of got a lot of... Of course, if certain things have been, have been done for years, maybe we have the money. Yeah. You could say that about uh, almost anything. Yeah. We got, we got, we got the, the loop link. link. What's that? We got the loop link. I, well, I think the loop, loop link is to, to take off on the old circulator. Of, on the In side. a way, the, the interesting about, thing about loop link that's not been sufficiently emphasized is that they're using existing routes. Right. And, and the circulator concept was the old one and even the new one under the connector. I don't know if you've heard about that yet. No. Uh, is to have a, a, a system just for the downtown. And then it would link into all the rail stations, even the existing bus system. But really, Loop Link, you've got, you've got uh, some buses that are coming in from the neighborhood that before, and currently, because Loop Link isn't open, they get hung up in, in, the, in the downtown. And that makes their reliability um, to be impaired in getting back out to the neighborhoods. So Loop Link will help solve that, that and it actually will provide better service for the neighborhoods, uh, not just for the downtown. So so that, so, so, so right. it's, it's, it's a really good experiment, but I think there's it's more than just an experiment. I think I think it'll work. When when is that going to start? By the end of this year, it look like by the end of this year, it's it's uh, <clears throat> so it's basically on Washington and Madison, okay. one way in each direction. Yeah. You can go see it right now. Yeah, they're building, they're building it, <laughs> and um, there's about four or five different routes that are actually going to be on that. On that it's segment, cir circulate between no, no, cross back and forth across the loop. Yeah, some some of which go to the neighborhoods. Others will go to a new uh, major bus turnaround facility at Union Station. Yeah, so that's all part of the plan too. Except that comes later. Yeah, um, they haven't started building that yet. I don't think it's so. A hole. Pardon me? It's a hole in the ground. It's a hole in the ground. <laughs> okay, uh, that will be online at the same time. The circulator concept was. Uh, back in the early 90s was a light rail system just for the downtown using that same corridor to get people back and forth across the loop and what we when we looked at the corridor of demand the most important demand that is out there is to get from the west side to the east side east side back to the west side yeah. so they're really serving the highest demand corridor now some people like John McCarran of the Tribune will criticize that and say that's the last place you should put it you should put it so you can bypass the loop and I said well Loop is still a major destination, <laughs> you know. So, anyway, you, you, we can have our differences uh, on that point, but I think it, it, it's the right way to make that that investment and introduce BRT or, in, in or, a, or the other option. Should, 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 should you call that BRT? Yeah, sure. I, I, is the bus driver going to collect the fares or the fare? Well, pay? initially, uh, they were supposed to have um, proof of payment approach or buy it off, off, and then board quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, rather than pay on board, yeah. you're going to have to show your fare 
to the driver still, but um, I understand that's going to be delayed. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. But the other option is down the road. Do you stop buses at, at a certain point in the downtown area? And they'll take driverless vehicles. They'll do some other. They'll, they'll, the buses will just bring people into this point, but not be hung up in the circulation downtown. That's a possibility, too. Um, you know, instead of having 10 different routes following each other, that do something along those lines. Well, one of the big challenges in the downtown are trucks and deliveries. And as you know, as people continue to order more online, deliveries are going to go up and have them going up. And so, you know, what is what is autonomous vehicles and autonomous drones and do for solving that problem? And getting trucks out of the loop. Well, there's also a big push to try to you know see if they can do off-peak hour truck yeah. deliveries. And we're actually studying that. You're studying that. <laughs> yeah. What about the, the London? I, I think in Stockholm they have a system. I've forgotten what it's called. Where you drive congestion. It. What? It's congestion pricing. Congestion is is that it? All under discussion for Chicago? Yeah, it has been. And it's been proposed to the mayor that that's maybe one of his revenue solutions for uh, his okay. budget problem. Yeah. But I don't think we have the congestion problems that um, plague uh, London or Stockholm. I've been in both towns recently. Okay. Um, uh, and it's very expensive. What, what the, so it was sort of it was imposed by the mayor of London okay. and then expanded. But they've had trouble expanding it any further than that. So there's been some resistance to it. But you know, London's really a dense, hard place to get around. But and, and we have another yeah. question. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure of you how many of you actually use Uber on a daily basis. I just used it this weekend. I go on there just now, and the app has already changed. So I don't know if you know this or not, but they also offer the app screen in Spanish. So someone's talking to them. Someone is getting to them to offer other languages. I'd love to open up this conversation, bring in RideScap, bring in App, bring in Lyft, give them these ideas because it sounds like someone's already communicating with them, okay? So maybe they're gonna have a translate button, you can pick your language and you can actually, you know, get it in any language. Just like, just like Google Translate, right? You're on Twitter and it's in French and you can't read it. The button will come up and say, do you want to translate it to English or whatever? whatever your Portuguese. So um, maybe in the future, instead of picking like a black car or an SUV, you would pick an EVA vehicle. So I have a feeling next time we talk about this, they're probably going to have some app modification and it's going to be gearing more in this direction. So David, maybe offer them at the table next time. It might be, it might be a great opportunity to just talk amongst people who are interested in the topic and give them ideas. Um, Ed and I know them really well, so through Transport Chicago, it's a nonprofit here, so we can always connect you with those folks. Sure, great, great idea. And the fact that FTA is looking, they're doing a lot of looking at this as well and doing some, some I guess, uh, trials, some demonstration projects, stuff like that too, so they're trying to figure out how this all, all, all fits in.